give that I do because I believe representation matters. So, do we have any um, gay identifying people in the house? Make some noise. Do we have any lesbians in the house? All right, bisexuals. Dr. Lulu in the house. Um, it's my trans community in the house. We are celebrating you today. Um, queer identifying people, that is me. I am queer as hell. Woo! Yes. Pansexuals. Woo! Woo! Um, ace arrow community. Asexuals. Aromantics. All right. Any kink people here? Woo! All right. Most important right? trick question we're going to be talking about today is that even if we are cishet, straight identifying, or not, we are all allies to each other. And we need to focus on being allies within our community. Yes. So we might be talking about the black trans child today, but it's really important for me to be here to be an ally within my community. To be an ally that challenges white supremacy and adult supremacy within the community. Um, and with that being said, I am going to pass the mic over to the wonderful Dr. Lulu to do a more formal introduction of herself. Give it up for Dr. Lulu! Thank you, thank you. Uh, not only that, the um, TED Talk. So, yes, me llamo Dr. Lulu. Yes, soy una doctora, like for real, I'm a real doctor. I know people on, on um, TikTok always ask me, what kind of PhD do you have? I don't know, the kind that has MD, I don't know what to tell you, right? So I'm a real doctor. I am Nigerian born. I like to say I was born, bred, buttered, and slightly burned in Nigeria, one of the most homophobic countries in West Africa. Let's hear it for the homophobes. I mean, we are the most people for them. After listening to a look yesterday, I changed my whole, and we're going to have to love on them even as they hate on us, but you know what? It is what it is. So I was born at the end of 60s, the 60s, and I know I don't crack, that's what they say, but um, I'll be 54 next month. Can somebody please? <laughs> and the reason we're doing this is my eldest child, who identifies as transgender, was transgender at birth, but of course assigned male by me, ex dad, and the doctor, because that's what we do when we don't know anything. So, but she says she's right now transgender and aromantic. So, yeah. What for Two days ago was, yeah, so I was very proud of that. Today is the um, first day of Aromantic Awareness Week. So today, actually, today, okay, well, you know. It's also World Day of Social Justice. Oh, well, that too. So, all kinds of things are happening today, because today is our first workshop, so let's hear it for the workshop people. Okay. Thank you all so much. I know you had to wake up really early this morning, and, and I appreciate that. But um, things have to just keep going. We know people are going to keep coming, so we got to start because we can't hold on any longer. Um, 1969, I was born, and my dad, when I was 16, I think we're going to tell them that because you watch it on the TikTok, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's just start. Let's just All start. right. So we actually wanted to recognize Brianna Gay, I'm assuming is how you say her last name. Um, I want to take a moment of silence. Um, although we are recognizing and celebrating the black trans child, Brianna was a trans child who was unfortunately murdered um, last week. Last week. Um, and a half. So if we can just take a moment of silence um, and celebrate her life real quick. Please grab one of the worksheets, get your pen and paper out. Did anybody get our love notes? Did anybody receive the love notes that we sent y'all? We sent little text messages over the last 24 hours. Nobody? Oh, no one, no one, nobody responded. We 
sent you a little love notes like, hi, uh, thank you for signing up, share with your friend, the pen and the paper. We're going to be doing a real workshop. Nobody's talking at anybody today. We're going to be all talking together. So if you all want to move in a little bit, that's okay. But if you want to stay there, that's okay too. We respect everyone's need for. We're not lecturing today. Yeah, nobody's. Yeah. Dr. Lulu and I are queer and tired. It's <laughs> early, so we're going to make y'all do all the work. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother workshop. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So um, we're going to watch my most recent TEDx talk. I do have two floating out there. This is the one that I think is most relevant. And you will see, I think the first question on, in the worksheet is about the TED talk. So get ready to start doing work already. Like we came here to enjoy, but we're doing work. Yes, we're doing work. So, ready? Thank you for your patience. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as queer. I'm also a pediatrician, a parent ally, and a parent coach. Today we're going to rethink the closet and explore a different process for sharing our lives as LGBTQ plus persons. During this talk, I shall interchange LGBTQ plus with the word queer, which is currently an acceptable umbrella term for members of the community. Ochiaga one of Amesi, aka my beloved, very traditional Nigerian Catholic evil father that I liked girls. He shook his head and waved it up and told me it was just the face. So I did what many children would do. I believed him. But I struggled with fear, anxiety, and shame about my sexuality and just have a hard time coming to terms with who I really was. However, I grew up, got married to my now ex-husband, had three beautiful babies, and did my very best to ignore my attraction to women. I failed woefully. I had always suspected that my eldest child, who was assigned a male sex at birth, was gay. Some parents just do. <laughs> well, like many families, we never talked about it at home. Not until the summer of 2020, at the awards ceremony of the graduation from Stanford University, the announcer kept saying they this and them that about my queer kid, about my kid. Puzzled, I asked, uh, son, can you go I thought you didn't want to get in the award. Who are all these people this man is talking about? That was when I learned about the non-binary gender and the they, them pronouns came in my orbit. Even as a great person myself, I wasn't having any of that. So my reaction was to push back and dig my heels in and insist on understanding exactly what was happening. 
huge mistake. Today, my eldest identifies as a transgender woman, and her pronouns are she, her, hers. And like you, I wondered, uh, why did she tell me about this when she was growing up? The answer is quite simple. I never created a safe enough space for her to do so. And today, I deeply regret her childhood days when I repeatedly insisted on saying, stop acting like a girl. Like me, many parents erroneously focus on first understanding rather than simply knowing. However, depending on their age and developmental stage, many children don't simply understand what's happening to them. So insisting on first understanding before affirming and supporting creates a huge obstacle in the parent-child relationship at that point. Not to make any excuses for myself, but what was happening was I was afraid and I allowed my fears to cloud my judgment. I focused on all the negative narratives that I heard about transgender women, particularly black transgender women. And in her own words, she said, Mom, our house was very homophobic when I was growing up. You and my ex dad were extremely transphobic. I allowed those narratives to fuel fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, and even anger in my heart, causing her much distress and nearly costing us our relationship. So what's coming out? Coming out is more than confessing a lifelong secret or managing the reactions of others. Robert Espinosa, Vice President of Policy, PHI. When we reveal our non-heterosexual or non-gender conforming identities to the outside world, it's often referred to as coming out. But what situation do people usually come out from? Addiction, depression, poverty, toxic relationships, you get my drift. Why then are queer persons placed in this category? While coming out is a critical part of our queer experience, right? The process as it is today is centered more on the person receiving the information and not the queer person, thereby giving them the power to accept or reject us. The revelation should be about our liberation, our visibility and authenticity, but is it though? Why do we have to manage the reaction of others or even explain ourselves in order to become fully accepted? Straight folks never have to do that. There are no huge revealing announcements for them, yet for the sweet person, for the queer person, not coming out feels dirty and even dishonest. Studies have shown that there are two big periods so it's not our behavior in queer youth. When they first realize that they're indeed queer, and when they come out to their family, specifically because of the fear of rejection, hence the often common decision to remain in the closet. But let me ask you though, whose closet is it anyway? I mean, whose great idea, what spreading was it to hide any human experience away in a closet? thereby completely invalidating our queer existence while in that space. And uh, whose decision will it be then after we were allowed out? And so like real closets, the closet metaphor has become a case of words imitating life. It serves the purpose of keeping our true selves hidden away from the public eye. We are often viewed as abnormal, unnatural, immoral, even a threat to the cisgendered heteronormative status quo. Au contraire, the reverse is the case. A huge reason why many queer folks remain silent about their identity is the clear danger that awaits us when we don't. Many of us experience anti LGBT persecution, bullying, homelessness, imprisonment, moral condemnation, ostracization. Homicide, amongst other things. And sadly, sometimes it comes from our own family members. As a result, up to 60% of queer persons experience mental health challenges like anxiety, depression, sexual assault, suicidal ideation, or even suicide at some point in their lives. That rate is up to two and a half times those of their straight counterparts. Unless I forget, Coming out is never a one-time thing. We must, on a daily basis, decide 
whether to reveal ourselves and whom to reveal it to. Pretty exhausting at the very least, if you ask me. For me, coming out gives the other person the power to accept or deny you. When you're inviting them in, you have the power. Karamu Brown, the queer eye. So what if we could completely eliminate the closet and the coming out process and replace it rather with the phrase inviting in? In this situation, the queer person invites you, the ally, into their world. The beauty of any invitation is it centers solely on the host who reserves the right to receive your invite or upgrade it to a VIP status. Inviting in is about autonomy and power and privilege. It allows the queer person to first ensure that you are safe before handing in your invite. And you, on the other hand, my friend, must earn said invitation. Replacing coming up with inviting in places the queer person in the driver's seat and who control their lives. Meaning, you have no entitlements, my friend. Rather, we initiate the sharing. Just honoring our lives before and after. What if we could completely eliminate cisgender ideologies like gender assignment at birth and allow children to be themselves? What if, what if no one gets to decide what's normal and what's not, who we love, and how we live our lives? What if? What if you don't get to be afraid of someone and just become assigned with the threat status? What if? And what if you could just throw the keys to the closet away for good? Imagine that. Imagine a world where queer persons are allowed to live their lives from birth to a natural death. What a wonderful world that would be, right? So how do we create safe spaces? How do we earn our decisions? How do you make this world a safer place for me, my child, and all LGBT plus persons? And there are many of us. As of February 2022, 7.1% of US adults identify as LGBTQ plus. So look around the room, and you never know. And so I'll tell you how. We must begin from within by and what I call U squared method. I know I'm not going to make uh uh. It's not a phase like my beloved father thought. It's not a choice like many of you think. It's not the other parent like my ex husband thought. It's not a mental illness. It's not from a sexual assault. It's not of the multiple myths, mistakes, and misconceptions about the pre community in circulation. And then secondly, you must welcome each of us as we are, as whole persons. And challenge negative narratives and moral judgments about the LGBT community. Meaning, seeing my child as a decent, as a decent human being and not a deviant black man. Thankfully, our relationship is on the end and we are thriving. And I'm the only parent that she's got, so uh, watch out. <laughs> and so in closing, I'd like to invite you to embrace the inviting in process. We all have aspects of our lives that society wants us to hide. For some, it's an abortion, maybe a bankruptcy or a disability. For others, there's a mental health challenge or sexual assault or even suicidal ideation. We should be free to share ourselves only with persons that we choose. Our thoughts should never be forced or acted without our consent. And for everyone, take a moment and just close your eyes, humor me for a second, and imagine, just reflect on what you mean to have a piece of your life hidden in a closet. And become kinder, more intentional, and even more mindful about people you meet, queer or not. And to the parents, well, first of all, to everyone, yes, do that, and as you do that, to the parents out there, there are multiple reasons why your child might not invite you into their queer world. Your job is to embrace your role as a parent ally, accept, affirm, and support them unconditionally, and at all costs, avoid making it about you. Yeah? Sure. And to the queer person, well, actually, even for the parent, let's go back a little bit. As you unlearn your biases, do me a favor and understand that 
direct questions like, so is you gay or is you not gay? Or are you sure you're really transgender? Are actually not a cool way to find out if in fact your child is gay or trans. Rather, approach your child's queerness from a place of curiosity. Ask questions like, what does my child want from me right now, today? How can I make their women lighter? How can I avoid being their first bully? Right? Yes! And to the queer person, first of all, your life has never been defined by closet walls, so only your Take your power back. You reserve the right to invite whomever you choose into your rainbow world. And if you don't remember anything else, remember this. You are worthy of love, you have value, and you are enough just the way you are. And so each October, as we celebrate LGBT plus history month, let us especially on the 11th national coming up and complex way these queer folks exist. So I'll leave you with this original point. While revealing my queer identity is about my vulnerability, I get it. By coming out to you, I'm actually holding you responsible for safeguarding my special interest. But by inviting you in, I become shielded and immune and inaccessible to your ability to hurt me in my vulnerability. And so I'll ask you this. Will you earn your invitation? You will make some work too. Which is not class is going to ask me. Can you dial your picture name or dial your picture name? Thank you. Mm, things that make you go, hmm, I've never thought about it that way before. So let's take couple seconds to sit with that material and um, then we're going to do some audience feedback, kind of maybe the feelings or emotions that came up while listening to Dr. Lulu's wonderful TED talk, um, some thoughts, and we're going to break them on the board and we're going to grow together. Are you homophobic? No, it just doesn't like you. It's racist. It's racist. <laughs> so we're gonna do. Uh, so I just well, really this is like my friend Jeremy called the brief space, and I uh, I got that lecture this morning. I like safe <laughs> spaces, but he likes brief spaces, and I thought you know what? There's a difference. So for brief spaces, you can literally share. For safe spaces, you can just keep. So you just keep what you want. So I want to hear what your thoughts are about the TED Talk. Is there anything you need to do with the TED Talk? Is there anything that makes you feel like you go, hmm, okay. And I'll give, I'll give them. And if you want to, I know I forgot to say my pronouns. I've been trying to learn how to say my pronouns. She, her, hers. Or like I say on LinkedIn, pay, her, hers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you want to just say that anyway, pronouns, otherwise you don't have to. <laughs>
summer and inviting you to come down. Then we actually also have Environment Day on August 2nd, which is James Baldwin's birthday. Um, to also celebrate how uh, he invited people in to his life. So that's why it wasn't accepted because I put March 11th for it. That's my birthday. Oh. Right? So I put March 11th and I actually applied for March 11th to be National Inviting Day Day. Not because I created the phrase, but I wanted to be known as the person who put the phrase on the map. So thank you for letting me because I did not know that. You know what snaps for me? I love it. I love it. All right, anybody else will take one more? One anybody from that time. side? Any feedback from that side? Going once, going. Loners. Name, pronouns, and then. Hello, my name is Lotus. Um, I use the pronouns. I'm from Detroit. That's important thing to know. Um, and I really like that the onus is really on like the ally to like act right, to come correct, as one would say. Um, it, I like the emphasis on like. It's not about your understanding of all the specifics. Is you gay or is you not gay? It's more about like you affirming and accepting them. But I think it's a really important like framing of like what how one should be after coming out. Because oftentimes it's like queer people who are like trained how to respond, how to react to this and this and this. Um, but really, the best thing, the most like preventative care type thing would be to have allies know how to better support people. Inviting in day is August second. Thank you so much for your amazing friends. And let us, as Ali pointed out, come correct. It doesn't matter really what the subject is, but whether you know we are an ally outside of the community or an ally in the community, we need to come with respect and give that person the dignity and space that they deserve to allow us to be a part of their lives instead of us forcing ourselves on them. So thank you so much for that wonderful information. <coughs> All right, so. Let the show begin. Oh, I'm so loud. I, I'm not, can y'all hear me? Yeah. I hate hearing this thing. Um, so we have an icebreaker, but really it's just to get our thoughts um, together. Um, we have two quotes here, and we uh, want you to kind of think about who is hearing this from a parent, guardian, teacher, alleged ally. <laughs> So, the first quote is, you have everything going for you. Now this, the second, you have everything going against you. This is just one more. So we're gonna let y'all just sit with that. So it's almost, almost too obvious. The question is why the parent, me, Felt the need to say that to me. That's the question. Why do parents feel the need to say that? All right, we're gonna real quickly. We are behind time, but we wanted to recognize some black transgender icons and people in history and now, because history is forever and always. Um, the first one, ah, Marsha P. Johnson. All right. My queer trans hero ancestor. and ancestor. <laughs> I just vibe with her so much. Trivia, who knows what the P stands for? Yes. Everybody, great. Good queer students. Um, Marsha P. Johnson's one of my favorite people because in her time, and really even now, Marsha P. Johnson was everything you should not be. She was black. She was I, I use that word how she described herself. Um, she was a drug addict. She was a sex worker. 
Um, she had mental illness. She was involved in a lot of criminal behavior. Um, and she still helped change the world. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, everyone can make an impact to make the world the place that it should be. So we have some volunteers. Who has Miss Major Griffin Gracie? Who has the Roberto. Uh, Miss Major Griffin Gracie. Uh, Miss Major is an activist, Stonewall veteran, and a community leader for the rights of transgender people of color. She has fought for black liberation, the abolition, and served as the executive director for the Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project, which helps trans folks in the uh, casserial system uh, in which they are disproportionately impacted. She now runs House of Gigi's, a safe haven and retreat house for transgender community in Arkansas. Thank you. So, we wanted, to, more than 20 years ago is an attorney who focuses on LGBTQ plus law and transgender rights. He is the founder and director of the Trans People of Color Coalition, the only national organization dedicated to the civil rights of transgender people of color, and the co-founder of the Transgender Law and Policy Institute. He is the first transgender American to testify before the U.S. Senate in favor of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Oh, who's that? We know who, do we know? Yeah. Angelica Ross? Angelica has recently come into the spotlight as one of the stars of the web series, Her Story. But she's also the founding CEO of Trans Tech Social Enterprises, a nonprofit that provides training and employment for transgender people. From the boardroom to the Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Hi, everyone. So, Courtney Ryan Ziegler. Courtney is an award winning artist, writer, and the first person to hold a PhD of African American Studies from Northwestern University. He is the director of the documentary Still Black A Portrait of Black Trans Men, run the Glad Media Award nominated blog Black Flagademic and was named one of the top 40 under 40 LGBT activists by The Advocate Magazine and one of the most influential African Americans of 2013 by The Route 100. Dr. Ziegler is also the founder of Trans Hack, the only tech event of its kind that spotlights trans-created tech and trans-led startups. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna move on. Um, before, before we go any further, really I want these are only five people. They want us to go out of our way to find black trans people who are doing things big they don't want. That's the whole idea. Because like we said in the hotel earlier today, like the dangers of the world that are already a factor in your life. So. Just to follow up off of that, I think that there is a history especially in the United States of the demasculation of black men from a lot of racist stereotypes and um, uh, systemic forms of oppression. Like if you look at the films like The Birth of the Nation uh, or if, uh, and other kind of media representations, I think that history makes it more, um, it makes it harder for us as black transgender women to 
be ourselves without almost disrespecting the struggle that our black community went through for years and years. So it puts us in this very precarious spot that is hard to, to uh, navigate. Thank you for sharing. And I, I just always have to go back and say, because I'm African, I mean, I am, from the motherland, we have to also think outside of the United States. I always want us to remember people are not alone in the U.S., not, not to say it I have to remember that all the time so people will remember it. Because I don't remember, I really remember it. That there's a black trans child right now in my village in Nigeria who will never, I'm telling you right now, never, ever. get killed instantly by their family members. And you'll get healed. Yeah. So we just discussed um, the um, black historical and cultural uh, impacts on the child. But now we want to kind of look at the historical and cultural context of the transgender community um, and how the way that trans women child thinks about themselves. And this is the moment that we wanted any black trans person in the space to speak. If you're not trans, if you're black, you're the first type of black trans person. Our wonderful friend. Thank you. Hi, my name is T. I'm from New York. Um, I'm actually a training view coordinator. But, uh, so I think looking at how the media portrays us, and I think it's hard for kids to come out. Uh, I see a lot of kids, they're nervous, they're scared, they, you know, they, 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 I hear kids tell me they just don't want to be murdered <laughs> sometimes. You know how hard that is? I mean, I think I, I think about it like, you know, when I was transitioning, I'm like, the one thing I had to struggle with is being black men in America. Like, with everything that goes on in the So, I mean, I think that is something that people don't talk about, they don't really unpack before they transition. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing, because that is, one of the things I see when people say, well, it's a choice, right? I say, nobody's going to say, well, give me uh, a slice of gay with this. Today's one of them. Thank you so much for helping me even to see that. Um, what do you think about this? One second, one second. I'm volunteering for me. Monique, sir, you can ask me. Monique, you can ask me. Hello, my name is Monique Corner Sheher. I'm the program manager of Train Services. This is that. Here in America, black people weren't even supposed to read. Um, and so there are so many things and so many layers to what we weren't supposed to have, and that isn't shared with black people. And so they operate in that uh, a lot of times, um, excuse me, they operate. So I come from a community where I was the smartest of them all, and so I stood out like a sore thumb, and I was picked on because I was smart. I was able to articulate my messages, and so then it was another layer of me in the church. I'm a PK, a, a preacher's kid, right? And so that's another layer too. And then on, the, on top of that, um, I was, I'm the baby. My transition started off rough because my parents didn't understand. Um, but then I, as their child, became their teacher. And so that was draining. I didn't get a chance for me to experience my transition for me. I was always teaching. And so that's the experience is, um, as a black trans person out of your history while also teaching others and it's training on a lot of people. And now in my position, my role, people for the population that I serve, they're so enamored by me because I have it together. I, and that's another layer. I have to present that I have it together when I, sometimes I don't, right? I may look good today, but you don't know what I went through. I probably had to go through like 10 or 12 different outfit changes. I had to cry it out. I never had the opportunity for me to figure those things out throughout my transition because I was always teaching others. And so that's just a layer. That's what we That was 
That was a whole, so that was a whole word right there. That was a whole word. And I, and I, I was, I, I crossed my fingers so I don't forget to mention that one of my next TED Talk highlights the fact that parents come into parenting as a student. And it should always be student, student. But in today's world, we think we are teachers. You can teach me about you all day. You can't teach me anything about me. And that's why parents must approach parenting as a student-student relationship. Hello, everyone. My name is Najma. I'm a very proud trans grandparent uh, who's raising um, a trans a trans black and girl. So I'm trying to figure out the right time when I can mention this as, you know, raising them. And just where's the information? Where are the resources? And it's all very hearing centric for people who can hear. And for me, who is a deaf-blind individual, and my trans child is deaf, I provide resources for my trans child. And to support her own development, she wants to create her own store to make, like, a, a store with different clothing that demonstrate and show deaf, like, art that show protecting deaf trans kids is important has her own store and she's already doing that and at the same time it breaks my heart is that how can I bring her to these spaces when it's not accessible for her and it's sad and uh, it's a bit awkward um, I know and the interpreter who's voicing for me right now is their aunt uncle ish so it's the small and so I consider MJ part of you know their family and their circle. And so I want to get a circle where there are other deaf, black, trans kids so they can support each other. Well, please lift it up. Oh my God! Thank you so much. And that brings me to a point that I made. I am crying right now. Yeah, like that, and, and you can. Yeah. That brings me to a point that I made, and I think I told you. When I was doing the research for this workshop. My own articles came up as the sole reference. So y'all in the space today, you all are the Calvary. You all are the first. This is the first ever of this workshop. Like I, it was, it was a thought in my head. What a few weeks, a few months ago, and I said, Jeremy, you think I should float this? Jeremy was like, totally, totally do it. Just do it. And I was okay. I don't know. But this is what I want to have to. I mean, damn, I forgot that pronoun. To know that. We're doing it, like we're building it. This is they, 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 okay, thank you. We're literally building the resource as we go. You think I'm recording this on my YouTube for nothing? <laughs> what about, what about with transcripts? I'm making it a book. Because we don't have anything out there. So thank you so much, and I'll stay in touch. Thank you. Oh, Jeremy, that was a minute. I have one more request. One yes. more request. One more request. Yes. Oh, I can't. I, my request is before the workshop is finished, I would like to get some of the volunteers to sign here if they're willing to sign We Support You so that I can send it to my trans grandchild. Oh, yes! Everyone, it's done already. Yeah, so make a video together if people are willing, um, maybe after. Um, so I can record, so I can send it to them after the conference. It's a done deal. Absolutely. Done. It's done. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, going off of what you said, when you bring in soul resource, the only thing that we love about um, our community, it's just death. It's, no, yeah. We're going to talk about that. We, yeah. If you look at black transgender women, it's just And it feels like that's all that we see. And then you go into spaces like this, and it isn't like right now. I feel like I'm being rushed to even say anything. And I'm one of the few black transgender women in the space. So it's like even in a space like this, that's supposed to be 
think it's supposed to be and then you have to think you have to it's like you had to pay six hundred dollars six hundred dollars for the most marginalized community the highest the past three years have been highest of of anything of being murdered. I just it just I don't even know. And like also going off of what you said, like we don't even have to educate our dash to say what I want to fucking say. Like I should not feel like I'm rushed right now. Because I have lots of fucking yes. like just give us time and give us space and give us housing, Thanks. give us health care and just like just, it's not that complicated. There, there aren't that many of us compared to cisgender people. There aren't that many of us. Like, you can just give us housing. You can give us resources to stay alive. There's no reason for us to be getting killed. There's no reason. There's no reason. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's no question. We're going to talk about And actually, one of the things that we mentioned that we wanted to do with this space was focus less on the negative, we wanted to talk about um, trust, joy, but it's almost, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's just so hard because there's this way, like, like we mentioned earlier on, it's just more, just, you know, data things. And yes, when I looked up, yes, I found Zaya's picture, which is why I put Zaya on there. And then I saw my articles. So you're right, there's none, and that's for the grandma also, right. you know, that, yeah. I that, that, that will, thank you. Thank you. Did they want to say something? No. Oh, we just missed the comment. That if you were referring to them again, did you mention them again? Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, is that the next one? Okay. So, we're going to discuss this, the systemic barriers that black transgender children face, and you kind of already gave us the word right now. Like half of that was what we were going to discuss. So, that's what you were going to face. And as I said, last night, Texas came for my chip again. Well, they're floating it. It hasn't been passed yet. But, Robert, do you think it's going to pass? You go to the Capitol all the time. Right. Well, that's what she has to do. What? Uh, no, I mean, in Texas, like many other southern states, and other states in general are facing increased backlash um, and attacks against uh, the LGBT community, but specifically the trans community, specifically more so than that, the tra uh, trans girls. Um, and so in Texas, I mean, there is uh, over 40 bills right now that are proposed, but it's, uh, uh, estimates are, are saying that there's going to be over 100, over 100 specifically for our state. Um, and given our climate, it's hard to say whether it's going to pass or not. You know, last year there were 73 bills. Um, one passed, which was, or no, sorry, last legislative session, where every two years in Texas, um, and one passed, which was the uh, trans participating in sports. Um, you know, a very similar bill is being introduced right now, which is for collegiate level. Um, but, you know, if one could pass last session, uh, again, who our governor is and um, our elected officials. And, and, and Texas is not unique, it's happening in other states. So um, I don't want people to say that just stay active and get involved, especially if you're not trans. Um, you know, they need folks and allies that are there at the Capitol, uh, just like anybody else. The state of Texas is losing people like me. I'm moving out this fall because I can, but I know that there are many people who cannot. And we cannot keep moving. I want us to discuss this. This is depressing, but I want us to well, discuss it. Anybody? Yes? They found that there are no over 340 anti trans films going across, at least in the United States, globally, the negative victim towards trans people is even worse. But the current legislative, um, I guess, is increasing not just our past, but at the end of everyone. And their families, thank you. Again, these children are not in isolation. They're in silos. One of my articles is literally titled When the Garnet Comes for Your Trans Child. So look it up. I mean, that's I was like, you know, if they come for my trans child, they come for me. 
Um, I just wanted to say in, in Minnesota we have a bill that's called the Trans Refuge Act. That is a bill that would protect any family, children, providers, etc., who are in Minnesota to receive gender affirming care from prosecution in their home states or from a child being removed from the state because they are receiving gender identity care, for example, or say the grandparents in Texas want to sue because a child, their grandchild in Minnesota is receiving gender affirming care and they want to take custody away from the parent. Um, moving rapidly through the state legislature, so I want people to be aware of it. And the other thing I wanted to say is there is the Ninth Annual Trans Equity Summit that's hosted by the city of Minneapolis, and it's free. Um, and they do a lot of uh, great work and have had uh, black trans-specific spaces um, in, in the Equity Summit. Thank you so much. This up, you have a Yeah. Okay. We always have time for anyone here until 10 30, until they kick us up. So, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but California is considered a sanctuary state. Yes. So, due to the legislative um, trans youth trying to seek um, some type of refuge, some type of resource so that they can get their affirming care. Um, and so, sometimes, how does it affect? to help my non-black people in my community 
just to push them and encourage them to be that person that stands right next to you and doesn't speak for you, but speaks with you following your lead. And that is my definition of ally. So oh, the, there we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my definition of ally in my book, my upcoming book is. An ally is a person who sees your fight, fights for you, and fights with you. Because the for you part, that makes it not performance. It's not a spectator sport. You gotta get dirty. You just gotta get in there. And not only with you is when I'm there, but when I'm not there, that's when I need you to step in. That's when you need to step in. My child needs you to step in. So thank you so much. So well, I want us to hold on to that, that question for the breakout session, which is coming out in a few minutes. I think this is the last slide. So just remember, how do you become? No, go ahead. We're saying okay. we have like 10 minutes left. So how do you become an ally? How do you, so just think about it, don't answer yet. And remember, I love what Monique just said, even as a black trans woman, how do you also become an ally for black community? And she used the word privilege. She used it. And that's what I wanted to say at the beginning, that sometimes when I walk into this, I have privilege. Even though I am at the bottom of the barrel, I'm still representing the people at the bottom. Something like that. So I love that Monique said that. Sometimes she is a privileged person, even though it's tired, it's exhausting, so many things to make sure everyone really knows what you want to do. Um, but don't feel like you need to. We have to do it. We have to do our work. So think, think about that when we do a breakout in a few minutes. And um, so that's my beautiful child who said, Mom, I do not want you to put a picture. I said, but this is the picture I pulled up online when I went to do my research. So I said, okay, I'm going to put that there. So the article is titled When the Government Comes for Your Child, for Your Trans Child. Go find it, read it, and show it some love. But that's the picture. Um, so discuss the ways in which you can help the black transgender children build resilience and resistance. And I want, Jeremy, I want to say that to me. You said it was profound about resilience. What did I say? About resilience. Oh. Because <laughs> that's, like, that's like. what I didn't know what Monique was saying. You know, it's like, oh, but you should. You should yeah, you know. to me. And I'm speaking on my own personal experience and beliefs. Um, resiliency is a great thing to have when you need it. Mm -hmm. But I think as a society, we romanticize resilience a little too much because when resiliency becomes a constant state of being, when you are constantly in that fight or flight mode, and I say that as a person who has PTSD from conversion therapy, like, when resiliency is your normalcy, that is not okay. And just like Kira said yesterday, like, we are not okay. But together, we can be. So, when we were just, after the slides were made, we were discussing this, I was like, how, like, discuss the ways in which you, as a we, can help black transgender children build resilience in order to thrive. Right, yes. We wanted to thrive to come out of this point. The word thrive, because that's what we are. That's what I said. We said we are thriving. Yeah. But at what cost? What cost? And so you said something like that. You said, I don't want to be resilient. Yeah. I don't want to be like, yeah, but oh my God, you're so resilient. But I don't want to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, I know that there was a study in like 1997 that I mentioned my first lecture that talks about the ACE study. Who knows about that? From Kaiser Permanente. It was not black trans kids or black trans adults at this point who were, who were, who did that questionnaire. They were mostly, actually not, not black people. But the rest, the result of that was, I found that I have, I have a score of four on my ACE. And you said you have a score of six. My kid has a score of seven. Four and up, for those of you who don't know, ACE is adverse childhood experience. The study was done on 17,000 respondents. And they found that people who score four or more have a high rate of suicidal ideation, addiction, depression, mental illness. All of them, yeah. right? My kid has a seven. And I'm sure, and I'm not trying to make sure this is what I'm sure, see these young ones in my heart. Yes, so I want us to remember that when, the, when you look at the, the black, next time you see a black person walking down the street, which is what I want this to be. I see you is a lot. Sometimes that's all we need to, 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 to just feel happy. Just make eye contact as you go. Because my child always thinks that, believes that they see her as a dear black man. Just eyeball her, give her a nod. Give them a nod. Give them a nod. Say something nice, maybe even. Because we do not know 
maybe that morning when they woke up, they didn't want to come. Okay, thank you. So, um, you're good. I want to give everyone a choice because we are extremely over time. We can do a 10 minute breakout session and go about five minutes over, or we can just go straight into a QA. It is a small group, so I feel like we might have already had our breakout session. So, are there, do we want to do a QA or do we want to get together in groups of four? QA part? Okay. So, questions? All right, so then the summary, we just want to talk about key takeaways from the workshop and how we can continue learning and taking action to support black sensitive children and kind of discussing that through a Q&A session. Um, so for your work, in your workshop, there are some questions. Maybe we'll just take them, we'll take them back to the people that sent you and discuss them. Um, this is going to be on my YouTube channel at, at Ask at Dr. Lim Talk Radio. That's my YouTube channel. The video is going to be there. Thank you all so much for just coming and helping my dreams, my ultimate dream, come true. And I, I, I told them, you know, I dream, I've been dreaming about this. I had this picture in my head where I'm standing and I'm teaching a class. I swear to God, I've been thinking about it. Today hit me as if it's happening. So thank you so much for coming. Um, at the back there, we have um, QR codes for y'all to stay connected with us. You know, pre-order my book. You're not paying any money. You're just getting notified when the book drops. Um, just everything about me and uh, some freebies and just ask us any questions we really, really, really truly appreciate that. is with the earnings and um, the publicity that you receive um, from this, um, the earning earnings and publicity that you receive and um, everything, where will that, will that be helping black transgender women or ch children? So I'm a mother of yeah, black transgender yeah. want to, I don't receive any earnings whatsoever from anybody. Um, the work that I did, I quit my job as a pediatrician two years ago to do this work. Mm -hmm. And I have been living on retirement from the U.S. and the city, which is not a lot. Mm -hmm. So there's no earnings. This is a total one dollar plan that I brought to you from yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we both have to pay this message. But I definitely appreciate the question. Yeah, okay, thank you. I just, um, I'm just bringing that up because there have been, even since Paris is burning, there have been many situations where cisgender allies have come into spaces, and that I think that's the biggest message I'm sure I send with. Where cisgender allies come into spaces, profit off and exploit um, the most marginalized of us, and then we're still dying. Yeah, we're still dying um, in San Francisco. We just lost Ivory Nicole Smith. Um, she was a staff member at San Putin Navigation Center, which is a shelter for transgender women. And there was a big supporter of me, like supporting me from beginning to the day she died. So, like, I know that's my point of privilege if I don't have anything else. Um, but just seeing, you know, especially, you know, not being from here, I know, you know, and where you're from is also very oh, hard as well. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, so it's just nice to see, you know, a parent, period, especially a parent of color, because uh, I don't see that every day. A lot of times I'm navigating you forcefully in a better direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right, so uh, it's good to see. And also, um, when you talked about being resilient, um, I think that's one thing that I wish I could 
see for my sisters not being so resilient. Nobody really wants to be a strong black woman. Like, they don't want to be strong. I'm sure, I'm sure they're tired of being strong. Like, I, I would like to see them be, you know, relaxed and comfortable and happy. And, you know, we talk about dysphoria so much, but, like, Right. I try to teach the kids euphoria. Right? I try to teach them to be happy and just be kids because a lot of times they don't get that. We have about time for one more formal question. I don't know if they're using this room after us, but I would love to continue this conversation and have these talks uh, informally. Okay, she, she doesn't, I mean, they don't think so. Thank you. We're going to keep going and y'all feel free to stay, feel free to go. I want to take a new photo because this for me is like. And we need to make her video. And then we need to make her video. Yes. Yes. They are video. They are video. Sorry, thank you for reminding me. All right. So I'm just, um, it's, it's more, well, I don't know if I have a question or statement, but um, I work in child welfare and with, you know, in a trainer, I have been training also in, um, in Pittsburgh, in the county, in the county. And I work with a lot of um, trans uh, youth. Um, whose parents, of course, we talk about family rejection, who are just not, you know, they're, they're just not fitting or breaking. And I know it's one of the big things um, to have. I don't want to understand the trans child. And, we, and I just don't know what, um, what training or what educational pieces I can give to a parent to help them understand. I, I wish I knew how, like, if, you, if there's some things that are good, um, you know, besides TED Talks, or is there anything else that I could give a parent, you know, or have a conversation or direct them towards um, educating themselves about their child? So again, I know it keeps coming back to me, but I can help. I'm a star, so it just connect with me. But also, we have a mom here who wrote a book. And I don't know if you want me to put your class because I didn't take permission, but um, they wrote a book about trans in a multiracial space. Hi, I'm Lauren, and I am the mother of a small group of my body. Child is not an adult. Actually, my book is from before they invited in. <laughs> Children 
ages, we have as young as five to 12, and then of course we have different variations of ages throughout the groups. And the parents themselves, they meet with each other to provide each other support as allies accepting their children while the kids have a space just to be themselves. And it's really worked really well because um, some of the kids have adopted other parents as that one supportive adult in their lives and it has brought in the fold other parents who don't understand or feel like they have to fully understand their child's journey before they can truly accept them in that student to student approach that you were talking about. So thank you so much for today and the work that you're doing and thank you for everyone who shared their voices. So much to more I comments, uh, questions? Julie's the restaurant lady. Nice. Yes. So thank you all so much. We'll you take your thoughts. Please let me know. I'll bring the mic to you. And then if you'd like to be part of the video for the awesome grandma, please, please. Okay. I think I'm answering this, please. And um, just there's one. You don't need too many, but I think that was an awesome request. And again, I just want to say thank you for your Thank you for everyone who holds this to each other. It is a true great space. We're going to play calm music. We're going to do two minutes of um, competition that we can just listen to during the moment. Okay. 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 Um, and we still have to move on to the kick us out. So, Diana, yeah. we're going to transition to the next session because yeah. we have to interpret oh, for the next session. Their, their video. Um, how, how do we get it to you? How do we get it to anybody? For whoever wants to be part of the video. You want to do it now? Do it now? Want to do it now? Yeah, can we do it? Um, so Jaren will show everyone how to sign if they want to be in the video. So just copy Jaren. Um, where should we set up? Oh, I think, uh, Maybe in the front. Right here. So if anyone wants to be part of the video, just come to the front and we'll teach you what to sign if you'd like to be part of the video. There. Just come near Jaren over here. I guess I'll be in the back. I know, right? <laughs> A little bit closer. A little closer. Closer. Side, a little closer. Okay, now this is practice. So follow Jared right there. Follow me. Point yourself. Point yourself. Step over a little bit. A little bit more. A little bit more. Okay, perfect. Now come down a little. Come closer. Okay. Point at yourself. That's the first side. Then your fists one under the other. Then your index and your chin and your ear. And then your hand open and closing at your chest. Okay, so just follow. Follow right now. Oh, that's trans. Oh, that's sign, yes. Okay. That's I, support, depth, trans.
the umbrella. Thank you. 
pay for this. Yeah. 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 Ye